Greetings. I'm Keith Setterholm. And I'm Tori Setterholm. We're members of Nativity Lutheran Church in St. Anthony Village, Minnesota. Our congregation aspires to be an inclusive community of faith that loves and accepts people as they are, wherever they are, in their journey of faith. We want to share with you an adventure that was educational, emotional, and heartwarming that occurred in November 2019 when 17 members and friends of Nativity flew to Atlanta, Georgia, boarded two vans, and began their seven-day civil rights movement journey in Alabama and Mississippi. People who watch these presentations will hear specific stories from real civil rights foot soldiers and journey to major civil rights historic sites. The presenters and writers hope that their stories will inspire in you new levels of curiosity, compassion, and creative action where issues of racial justice are concerned. They do not aspire to solve racial inequity, but there will be proposals for action that we think you could take to improve understanding and work toward justice. Today, Jerry Hoffman, Pastor Emeritus of Nativity, will have a conversation with Mark and Leslie Spigham, who led the tour. Mark and Leslie are longtime activist members of Community Lutheran Church in Edina. They are both retired teachers who have led over 20 groups on this journey where participants go to the places where significant events happened, meet the foot soldiers who participated in the civil rights movement, and their heirs who carry on the mission. You'll learn why Mark and Leslie lead these trips and what they hope will be the impact on the participants. Their goals for these trips are to know the history and to develop relationships, reconciliation, and repentance. I know that both of you were in education. Uh, what did you teach? What in? Well, I was an elementary teacher um, and uh, did some administrative things as well along the way and um, had different assignments in, within the elementary. But um, yeah, elementary education. Younger children, older children? Um, most of the time, like uh, older children, third through fifth, but sometimes younger children. And sometimes I sort of specialized in working with populations like um, I worked with a lot of Somali in immigrants. Ah. Um, I, I worked with a lot of kids who um, uh, had been unsuccessful in school and, okay. and needed to, to gain proficiency and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Leslie, what I was taught at Wayzata High School, and um, I taught advanced placement biology and human anatomy uh -huh. for 34 years. And uh, those are mostly juniors and seniors. And... Um, just an amazing population to, to teach. Uh, <laughs> so it was a great, great career. I loved every day. There wasn't one day I didn't want to go to school. Oh, so. good for you. Good for you. You became very interested in the civil rights movement. How did that happen? Um, well, a little bit probably has to do with the fact that we were both teachers. Um, uh, we had our summers available to us generally. Um, and we had a family. We had two daughters. Um, we uh, would oftentimes, before taking a trip, uh, no matter where we went, we would do some learning and studying ahead of time. Um, maybe our daughters weren't always so fond of that. Uh, they would pr prefer that we just go on a trip and not have to learn something before we go. Uh, but um, in this case, um, uh, I put together an itinerary for a civil for a civil rights trip to again mostly Alabama and Mississippi at the time. Um, at that point, and that was 18 years ago now or so. Um, at that point, uh, I did not know many, if any, foot soldiers really, um, and uh, certainly knew some of the sites that we wanted to visit and the experiences we were going to want to try to have. Uh, but even some, some of that didn't really know yet about, uh, too much about. Um, anyway, so that was the, that was the, the beginnings. And uh, what I would say that happened because of that trip was uh, we learned a lot about, uh, uh, we learned how little we knew. 
we, we almost embarrassingly so, um, that this, this is things that hadn't been taught to us, uh, that we hadn't learned, and we felt an obligation to, uh, to get, get up to speed. And, uh, and so upon returning from that trip, uh, to kind of did everything we could to, to learn more over the, over the years ahead. Leslie, before you went on that trip, was there interest in the family about this? You, it, something about this issues around civil rights? Or was this just an interesting trip? Well, our, our church, Edina Community Lutheran, has been very uh, much in the forefront with social justice issues, whether it was the American Indian Movement and just all, you know, gun control, all kinds of things. And so, and we've been members there since 1978. And so I think the church fostered a good background for us to be curious and wanting to do social justice work. And uh, so I think all along, and even with our daughters, you know, doing volunteer work along the journey in social justice and that kind of thing, they were primed and kind of ready to continue. Our older daughter went to Carleton, and she was an African American studies major. And our younger daughter went to Luther, and she was an African American studies minor, which is, I think, a little bit unusual for two Lutheran girls. So um, anyway, I think the church really fostered our our curiosity and dealing with social issues, and then that led to the study of the civil rights movement. Then you decided at some point that you would be willing to take groups of people on trips. I think you have done 23 of those trips, but how did this get started? Um, well, I think what, what, really, uh, what really happened was the, the realization, and I think it's probably true for a lot of us, is that as we get older and we're learning more and more about whatever the topic is, at some point, you sort of say to yourself, well, I'm a lot smarter, um, big deal. <laughs> you know, what am I gonna do with it? So uh, what, what we decided to do um, was uh, to try to emulate what our experience had been by bringing a group of people uh, adults, if you will, um, and uh, just at that point thinking we're just going to have a one-time experience likely and it would be a fun trip, a fun experience. Uh, essentially I was, we were going to be bringing friends, friends from our church, people we knew, and uh, as a consequence uh, we put together a, sort of a random group of people you might say that wanted to go on an adventure the, for the first for the first time, yeah. Wow, you're doing this in your retirement. <clears throat> you're doing anything else in the retirement? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're real active at our church with racial justice. I'm one of the co-chairs of our racial justice action advocacy team, and um, you know we do other stuff at church too. I'm working on land acknowledgement stuff with church, and um, you know on various committees and that sort of thing. So we do that. We do um, child care for our grandchildren. And, uh, you know, so d days get full even during a pandemic. It's amazing how much Zooming we do and, mm -hmm. and all of that. We, we had no idea when we first started leading these trips um, the time commitment that it was going to eventually take. It certainly didn't at first. Um, in fact, I joke about it that I wasn't, I, the first trip or two, I didn't even save really the materials uh, because I wasn't thinking we were going to be, you know, redoing this. And, uh, um, and, and so it, it started to evolve. First it was just a, uh, a trip, uh, one trip. And then the next year uh, when another group came to us and, and asked about a possibility of a trip, we, we decided to do a trip like in the spring and then somebody thought they wanted to go in the fall, so we did that. And then it wasn't too long before we're doing two trips in the spring and two <laughs> trips in the fall. And then pretty soon there's a summer trip thrown in there. And then pretty soon we're even doing three, trying to do three trips mm -hmm. in the fall and things like that. So it just kept getting larger and larger over, over time. Yeah. 
the way that we got involved here at Nativity is a good friend of mine had been on one of your trips. And he came back and happened to meet him on a social occasion. And we got off in the corner and he was so excited. He thought this was the best trip he's ever been on his life. And I know they traveled a great deal. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. <clears throat> That's why I contacted you after about six months after uh, that. I okay. thought, ah, I want to check this out and see what that was like. Yeah. Well, that's that's commonly how um, this trip has sort of been, um, we'll call it advertised. There hasn't been any advertising, but mm -mm. Um, it, through word of mouth, uh, people have come back and and feel especially passionate and in some cases might use a word like they just feel almost transformed. And and they really want to share this experience. Um, and And so that's kind of what's happened is then I get a random phone call from somebody <laughs> who says they heard through the grapevine and uh, nine times out of ten I say to them well um, why don't you talk about it with a group of people and when you have a group ready um, give me a call back and we'll we'll try to make it work so, yeah. with the pandemic we have seven trips that had to be canceled and so uh, when we're free to travel again because we keep getting new requests so it's going to be a bit of a logistical <laughs> issue to get this all figured out but we'll yeah. figure it out yeah on your trips <clears throat> there's kind of two major things that happen uh, we go to places that are really special in terms of the whole civil rights movement and the other one is that we meet those people who are called foot soldiers would you like to explain what is a foot soldier well a foot soldier is a term that um People who have, that were in the movement have tended, they kind of coined the term, if you will. Um, uh, there's a loose definition. It's somebody who was involved in the movement. Um, uh, now, you could argue that sometimes the foot soldier was really involved and they played a major role. And other times, maybe a lesser role or a more minor role. And, and I don't know that one always needs to differentiate uh, but um, nevertheless, that's where the the term kind of kind of comes from, and uh, it it um, uh, I, I think for in most cases um, uh, the the foot soldiers are are you know because of uh, when the movement happened in the 50s and the 60s, the foot soldiers tend to be in their 60s, late 60s, 70s, 80s. And frankly, most of them are in their 70s and their in their 80s. And unfortunately, we are losing we are losing foot soldiers. They are, they are dying, and uh, there's probably at least five people now. I I would have to go back and count for sure, but there's probably at least five people that we have met with over the years who are no longer living. I would invite uh, Leslie, I want you to answer this first. What is one foot soldier that, if of all the foot soldiers, that particularly comes to your mind, and why would that be so? I think uh, the person that uh, comes to my mind is Jeannie Gretz and her husband, Robert Gretz. Uh, they were involved in the bus boycott in the 50s. <clears throat> Both of them have now passed away. Jeannie just passed away a little bit ago. And they have done justice work their entire life since they were in their 20s and they passed away when they were in their 90s. And they never let up. They were just constantly doing justice work. And I think they serve as a wonderful model for the rest of us. You know, just because you retire, you don't retire from justice work, uh, was Jeannie's comment. And they were really involved in um, the Lutheran Church. Uh, pushing for LGBTQ rights and all kinds of different human rights. And so I think if I had to hold up one couple, it would be Bob and Jeannie Gretz. And it's so sad that they are no longer with us. You didn't mention the fact that he was a white and he served the black congregation. Exactly. His first call. Uh -huh. Right, yeah, white pastor <coughs> serving an all-black congregation in Montgomery, Alabama. And um, he had been known to be a bit of a... I don't know if rabble rouser is the right term, but he was uh, at that time, I, I'm, was it an ALC pastor, I think, and then whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when he went down there, the bishop said to him, you know, whatever you do, Bob, don't cause trouble. And 
Bob's explanation for that is I didn't cause the trouble, I joined the trouble. <laughs> and so that was his way around that, that situation. I know there's a couple of things I remember about his story <clears throat> and their story. One was that he, he drove his car he, during the transportation when there was a bus boycott. Mm -hmm. And the other one was how uh, their home was bombed and how they taught their children to anticipate that type of thing might happen and how they could hide to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's two different books that he has <coughs> written that really describe what it was like during the bus boycott and, you know, how their household really worked to, you know, to help the people. Now, Mark, what would be one person that's a foot soldier that comes to your mind? Well, I, you know, there, there, there are so many, uh, but I guess one of the pr people that I would point to maybe would be Charles Avery. Um, he's a foot soldier from Birmingham. Um, as a senior in high school, he uh, led a protest, a march, if you will, um, of around 800 students. Uh, about 10 miles from outside of Birmingham <coughs> into Birmingham. This was in the time of the of the Children's March, and kind of what happened was that the, uh, you know, uh, it it seems hard to believe by today's standards, but when you lived 10 miles away from the 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 central part of Birmingham, you oftentimes didn't even know what was going on in the middle of Birmingham, uh, and. Uh, uh, in this case, they had heard that their, you know, children were protesting, and um, and thanks to the work of people like Charles, he organized and they marched. And you know, you hear those stories, and it does it just doesn't seem it doesn't seem possible that 800 kids independently, not without, you know, they're not calling home and checking with their parents. Their ages are from seniors in high school to as young as first grade, are, are leaving school and going into Birmingham. And then of course, when they get there, in most cases, they're arrested and jailed in, in some cases for, for several, several days. Um, one of the reasons that I think that his story is so important, first of all, I think it gives all of us hope including kids uh, and youth today. I think it's a story um, when, when we have brought youth groups on this trip, um, I just sort of enjoy sitting back and looking at the, at the expressions on the kids, on these kids, because they, they're just like, uh, you know, they're, they're in the presence of, some, of a story here that they, they, just, they just can't fathom, and they are the same age as as Charles was when, when he uh, you know, was in high school. Um, but the other piece of that is, uh, uh, as it has been true with so many of the foot soldiers, we have, we have uh, developed really close friendships and personal relationships with, um, with so many of the foot soldiers. And Charles is just an example of that. You know, he's just, he's just become like the closest friend and while we don't see each other too often, um, you know, we talk on the phone, uh, we're always on Facebook together, uh, checking each other, what's, what's going on. I, I uh, just recently uh, listened to one of his worship services from his, his church that he is so proud of. Um, he's actually, the, the church that uh, he is a member of, um, he's, he, he, the land was from his family and they, when they came from South Carolina, um, they ended up in this area of Alabama, and um, and so it just has this long, long uh, history. Uh, but it's been a reminder that in the end, um, I think with regard to racial justice, we have to figure out better ways to have uh, relationships with people if we're going to uh, make a difference. Um, Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative always uh, talks about proximity, and and uh, you know uh, that's an important thing to always keep in mind. You know, he always says we we as white people, especially, 
need to figure out how to put ourselves in proximity to people of color so that we not only learn, but more importantly, perhaps, that we, we form relationships and friendships, and that will change, change how we view things. One of the things on the trip, whenever we came across some foot soldiers, I, I always noticed when they saw you and they lit up. They were so glad to see you. There were hugs, there were, you know, and, and there was encouragement. And there, you've set up a, a very dynamic relationship with those people. So that, that was very impressive. You know, it may, it may be hard to believe, um, but it has been said by a few different foot soldiers to us is that they, they're kind of amazed that a group of white people, I mean, it's a, sad, it's a sad statement in a way, but they are kind of amazed that a group of white people want to know this information, that they want to they wanna be there, they want to experience it. Um, and it speaks to, I think, the divide that, that exists in our country uh, today, um, that, um, that, that people of color perhaps um, don't uh, don't um, recognize th uh, that um, this 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 topic this uh, this idea is one that it resonates with um, with all of us, um, but that as we become more and more um, uh, kind of uh, um, as as as, as as we become more immersed in 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 issues of of uh, equality and and equity and so forth, um, my hope would be that that we wouldn't be seen as an exception, <laughs> as white people coming to the South to learn about this. And by the way, we don't have to go south to do that. We can do that in our own neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We 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 can we can do that in Minneapolis. So in St. Paul. So yeah. Uh, you talked about the people, and I thought that was probably the top of all the issues that we involved with the trip. But there are places, and I'm going to challenge you, what is one particular place that you, I'm start with you, Leslie, what is one particular place for you that's very important and you want people to hear that story? Wow, that's hard to know. Um, there are so many important places. Um, If I was going to pick one that I think people know a little bit about but not a whole lot is the story of Emmett Till. And to go to the town of Glendora in Mississippi where the murders took place and then to go and be able to stand on the bridge where his body was thrown into the Tallahatchie River, that that just kind of stops you in your tracks. Could and you tell you, me who, who's Emmett Till? Oh, Emmett Till oh, is yeah. a young man from Chicago who had gone down to Mississippi to stay with family for part of the summer. And he was with his cousins in a little grocery store in a little town called Money, Mississippi, and um, was in the store alone for a little bit. And after the fact, the white store owner accused him of flirting with her or whistling at her. And as a result of that, she told her husband and then he and his uh, brother-in-law came and kidnapped Emmett Till in the middle of the night from his family's home down there and tortured him and mutilated his body, murdered him, and then threw him in the river. And since then, it has, the woman who accused him has now declared that that did not happen, but she just said it. You know, white women were doing things like that. and. Um, we're, we're in the middle of reading White Fragility and, and the chapter we read just most recently, uh, when white women cry, black men get hurt. And that's exactly what happened in that case. And 14 year old boy. And that was, I think, that, that just really is such a, a powerful, powerful statement about the terror uh, that people lived with on an everyday basis and we're still seeing that terror today. Um, and so that that would be my spot. I think. Wasn't he also the uh, came from Chicago? He, he was yes, there. Yes, he was yeah. from Chicago. Okay. Yep, his mom was a teacher in Chicago, and then um, he went down for the summer. And we took a bus down to stay with family in the summertime. And 
He didn't know the rules. Didn't know the rules. <laughs> right. Mark, for you, one place. Um, well, I, w I would say that um, Rueville, Mississippi is a, a really important place. Um, and uh, r the, the story of Rueville is, is there's, there are many stories. But certainly um, one of the more important stories is the story regarding Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, now, Fannie Lou Hamer is somebody that uh, I dare say most of us, mo and I'll sp I guess I'll say most white people particularly, probably don't know this, may, may not even know her name, <clears throat> and certainly may not know her story. Um, but. Uh, and, and, and to some degree, I, I knew her name before we ever went there the very first time 18 years ago, but that's all I, I mean, I, I'd heard her name. I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you why she was important. But uh, she lived in Rueville, and in, in Rueville, um, she um, and her family, they worked for a sharecropper. Uh, I, the, the, uh, they were sharecroppers, excuse me. Uh, and... Uh, um, uh, on a plantation, on the Marlowe Plantation. And uh, because she was determined at, to um, register to vote and actually went and did register to vote. Tried to register to vote. She was, t she was told, after she had registered to vote, she was told that she better go withdraw her registration and if she doesn't withdraw it, she had to leave the plantation. Well, she refused to go withdraw her registration, and and as a result, um, was was kicked off of her her plantation. Um, that uh, we when we are in Rueville, we meet with Charles McLaurin, who is another foot soldier who worked closely uh, with Fannie Lou Hamer. He was quite a bit younger than her at the time, but they really worked as a team and. Uh, Charles uh, tells us the stories of Fannie Lou. Fannie Lou t is buried, along with her husband, in a cemetery uh, uh, on, on her land. She actually owned some land. Um, she was an amazing woman that she had a hog farm, and she was, was feeding the hungry by, by, ra by raising hogs, uh, Giving giving the hogs uh, to, so that they they would have piglets and uh, and 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 trying to um, rejuvenate kind of the economy of that of that area, she went on to be elected to the um, uh, what was at that time called the uh, Mississippi Freedom Party, and it was sort of a um, an attempt to skirt the the Democratic Party. Of Mississippi at the time, she ended up having coming to Atlantic City at the 1964 convention, and um, with television cameras rolling, she gave um, just an amazing uh, speech to uh, to America, really, um, about what it was like to grow up black in in America. Uh, it was so controversial that at that time President Johnson, who was watching this and was hoping to be nominated to, uh, for, for uh, pre the, the, uh, the, the ticket, uh, was concerned about how this will, uh, would be viewed. And um, she, was, she was taken off the air quickly because he called the press conference. Well, they, they still recorded it and uh, that evening it, it was all played but um, she was a phenomenal person um, that um, should be raised up much more than, than she has been. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The, and that's what the trip was often about, these places and these people, and you're sharing these stories. Uh, I, I wouldn't have necessarily picked her as the one that you would talk about, but, I, but while you uh, mentioned her and told her story, it really captivates me again now. Another question. I know you have a lot of material, books, videos, and everything in your library, but what is one book right now that you think you would encourage people to read? Oh, wow. I guess it depends on 
on what their focus, sh what they want their focus to be. Is it to learn history, to understand the tra generational trauma, or is it to look at their own whiteness and how has our white culture <coughs> impacted everything? Um, I think the book Cast, which is a recent thing coming out, I think really shows the trauma. And I think if people don't know that history, I think that would be a good place. Um, and I guess I would highly recommend it if people haven't done that. It, it certainly helps you understand why things are the way they are today. Okay. Mark? Yeah, I, 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 I agree with Leslie that I think it does depend on where where you um, feel you're at. <laughs> um, when, you know, when we first started leading these trips, I, I sometimes apologized almost a little bit because I felt like if the trip was just historical, that that wasn't enough. Since that time, I sort of have come to realize that, uh, especially we as white people, I think do not know the history. And, you know, until you understand the history, um, you can't understand things like the trauma that an African-American may feel today here in Minneapolis when they're pulled over by a police officer or, or when something happens in their neighborhood um, uh, uh, with violence or something like that. Um, to understand the history um, dating back 400 years it means that uh, you c you put that in context and you realize this is the this trauma has been ongoing and so um, if you're if you're looking at um, uh, if, if you're looking at history then I then I think uh, there are there are a number of th there are a number of books but I I I, I don't know that any particular one is is better than any other on the other hand if you're looking at if you're if you're looking at yourself as and, and thinking okay um, w as a white person where where what's my responsibility or or um, what's some food for thought then I then I think like a, a book like white fragility um, can really open your open your eyes to um, to your own whiteness. Yeah. Final. <laughs> the final thing, and you're very involved in your congregation, and I know this congregation has been really up front in dealing things with, uh, so with justice. Uh, tell us a little bit about your congregation and what's going on now and your role in that. Well, um, Obviously, during the pandemic, things are a little bit different. We miss being together as a congregation. Um, our congregation is, is in Edina. It's just a few blocks from 50th and France. But our membership is not all Edina residents. A lot of our people do not uh, live in Edina. Um, our church has been involved in our, the LGBTQ justice issue since 1983. We're reconciled in Christ Church back in 83, which was at the beginning of looking at justice for LGBTQ. And um, as far as racial justice right now, our congregation has just embarked on what's called a racial justice journey. And what it is, is like a five month series now in the spring and then another set of, of sessions in the fall dealing with racial justice and how to become an anti-racist congregation. And how do we get all the members or a good portion of them kind of on the same page using the same vocabulary come you know understanding the same concepts we were hoping maybe 50 75 people would be willing to go on this journey and we have 286 uh, which is unbelievable it's like oh my goodness so uh, you got a huge congregation or is it uh, how many people average worship there average worship 275 something ah, like that. Ah, just about almost. <laughs> yeah, and our membership is probably, you know, when you cut sure. count it, all baptized <laughs> and whatever, 800 yep. maybe. But in terms of Sunday worship, maybe 275, maybe 300 um, on a typical Sunday. That's significant. Yeah, and so it's a huge group. And, and the people that are coming and joining this racial justice journey are 
Hello um, and welcome. kids too. We've My got middle schoolers, Shirley, high schoolers, and, and then all range of adults up to people in their late 80s. So it's really an intergenerational thing. We've hired a facilitator uh, to help us move through this journey. And uh, we've only had one session so far, so we're looking forward to more of them. Um, and so that's kind of a congregational thing. We have a racial justice vision team that is kind of coordinating that and then working with each of the different areas of ministry in our congregation to make sure it's racially justice themed. And then our own committee, our racial justice action advocacy, uh, we did a lot of things with voting rights uh, before the election last fall, figuring out how to help people register, not telling them who to vote for, but making sure they're engaged in the process. And we're working on cash bail right now, how to work on eliminating that, dealing with mass incarceration, land acknowledgement. So there's all kinds of little avenues that all are under the heading of racial justice that we're working on. So there's lots to do. Anything you can add to that, Mark? I think what, what one of the things that's happened in our congregation is that uh, approximately 100 people have have been on the civil rights trip. Uh, we've led about 200 people in all, but, but about 100 people have been from our church. And um, that has given us a common experience, a common vocabulary, and I might say kind of a common passion for, for many. And it had also meant that an, an outgrowth of that is sort of like the ongoing um, thoughts you have after you return from the trip. And so people are constantly sharing emails or events that are happening, um, things that, you know, a play that is going on and, 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 and conversations and things like that. And I think all of that, you sometimes don't realize how that has uh, just an ongoing effect. And um, so I think, I think that, has, uh, that has played a significant, a significant role in, in, the, in the life of our congregation. Having said that, you don't have to go on the trip to have that passion. And there's certainly other ways to, uh, to gain that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but that has certainly been a part of it, yeah. We hope you were inspired by this interview with Mark and Leslie and by the remarkable people and experiences they shared with the group. This is the first in a number of presentations about the Civil Rights Movement Tour. We invite you to join us for those additional presentations. Our Nativity mission statement is, Loved by God, we love others courageously.